Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Ensemble Network webcast. Thank you to all our listeners who tuned in today. My name is Jennifer Wright, Senior Director, Employment and Diversity Initiatives for the Mining Industry Human Resource Council. And joining me today is our special guest speaker, Tara Denhe from um, Engendering Success in STEM. As many of you know, NIR established its mandate to identify opportunity and ultimately address the HR and labor market challenges in the Canadian minerals and metal sector. The Canadian mining industry faces a significant challenge in establishing a sustainable supply of labor that is able to withstand mining's economic volatility. MIR, through its labor market intelligence, has identified a number of factors exasperating this challenge. Canada's aging population continues to have a significant impact, and diverse groups such as women and newcomers to Canada are underrepresented in the mining labor force. Our research indicates that women comprise half of Canada's population and about 48% of its labor force, yet in the mining labor force, women represent only 17%. Improving this statistic involves a combination of collaborative solutions from encouraging young girls to pursue math and science studies to building a gender inclusive awareness of the industry to appointing more women in senior leadership and board positions. Today, during our webinar, we will hear um, directly from Tara uh, Denhay, Dr. Tara Denhay, who is a postdoctoral researcher working with Dr. Tony Schnatter and, and the Gendering Success in STEM Consortium, a research partnership with a shared goal to foster women's inclusion and success in STEM. Tara, I will uh, turn the floor over to you uh, for your presentation. Hi all, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm going to talk with you a bit about the results from a survey we recently did on workplace culture, but before we jump in, I wanted to just briefly orient us to kind of some of the things that we'd like to cover today. So first, I'm just going to introduce myself and the consortium briefly, um, kind of give you an overview of the sources of data that I'll be drawing on in this presentation today. A uh, little brief snippet on women in mining, although Jen already covered that. Um, kind of talking about troubleshooting the idea of culture and what culture is. Um, we'll discuss the results from our RISE Workplace Culture Survey. Um, discuss an upcoming project that we're in the middle of launching right now called Project RISE. And then have time for Q&A at the end. All right, so starting out, um, I'm a member of a consortium that is funded by the um, by SHRC, and it's kind of a cross-Canada consortium designed to promote the inclusion of girls and women in science and engineering across Canada. Now, this consortium is kind of a great uh, combination of social scientists, STEM experts, such as scientists and engineers working both in STEM academia and as well as in industry. Um, as well as educational and professional partners, which is people in industry and in, um, and in education, who are all coming together with this shared goal of promoting the inclusion of girls and women in STEM. Now, this consortium kind of focuses across the span of development. So we hear a lot of people complain that there are issues with the pipeline, and we're really trying to target every single aspect of the pipeline here, beginning with children, with our project CLIMB, which is looking at how can we change implicit biases early in childhood, prison in adolescence, how can we motivate women to choose a STEM career and kind of encourage boys to view girls as teammates. Think focusing on college students and how to cope with the transition to the first job. And finally, Project RISE, which is with adults working in the workplace and it's focused on how can we create and build more inclusive workplace cultures. So Project Okay, I just got an announcement, but <laughs> all right. Um, so the, the, this is kind of our pro, the majority of our Project RISE team. This is led by Dr. Tony Schmader, who's the director of the ESS Consortium, as well as Dr. Hilary Burke, speaker. Um, so we are all focused on how do we promote the inclusion of women in the professional workplace. And Project RISE, which is the data that I'll be sharing with you today, is kind of part of this overall mission. We have our workplace culture survey as well as the um, 
kind of in progress uh, to be launched study that I will be telling you a bit more about later today. All right. And so quickly, just to orient you, I'm going to be sharing data from a number of sources. Um, much of it is from our team, but just to kind of cover cover the range, there are little icons that will appear on slides with data sources, and of course, these will be made available after the webinar. Um, so this is just quickly, we have data from our workplace culture survey, uh, from a study that actually um, preceded this current research called it Engendering Engineering Success, data from members of our consortium that isn't, that isn't specifically part of part of Project RISE, uh, data which we have borrowed from MIR, some not, data from non-ESS academic research as well as governmental sources. So now to, to start out with, um, as Jen mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, there's an issue of representation in mining and other STEM industries. Um, in mining, women make up only about 17% of the workforce, and this is pretty well below the number of women that we even see at earlier stages in the pipeline, you know, entering college, for instance. And um, so there are a lot of questions and a lot of discussion that have come up around this issue of representation and kind of what causes it uh, and how do we solve it. Our team is particularly interested in the idea of tackling workplace culture. So one reason that women who are otherwise successful and motivated and engaged wind up leaving STEM fields is this idea that they are in a chilly or unfriendly workplace culture characterized potentially by the presence of conflict, by feeling isolated or ignored, left out, or by feelings of social identity threat, which is these kind of subtle feelings that you're being excluded or you're being devalued on the basis of your identity, and it can really just make you feel like you're aware of gender. So gender is just really salient in your environment. And these kinds of factors can all be major contributors to why women decide to leave STEM fields, including my own. Now I'm gonna focus kind of on this issue of culture and underrepresentation briefly to kind of discuss how some of these factors can play out. So first, um, what goes into and what creates culture? Culture can seem like a bit of a nebulous concept. Um, it's something that we are surrounded by that permeates everything, and it very much characterizes people's experiences of a workplace environment. So the way that we approach this as a team is we've been thinking about culture as being created by three main factors. The first, being institutional norms, policies, and practices. The second, kind of the nature of your colleagues or the people in your environment beliefs, their biases, their attitudes. And then finally, interactions with colleagues. And you can see that these are three levels of kind of factors that may influence the experience of the workplace environment and workplace culture. Now, when we think about workplace culture, um, all of these things can influence each other. We can think about institutional norms influencing how we interact with colleagues, for instance. If we have certain policies in place that require that, um, you know, there be at least two women on a team rather than having a solo um, woman on a team of majority male engineers, that might be a policy that could influence the nature of interactions with colleagues. Similarly, kind of the individual beliefs or biases that people hold can influence their interactions with each other as well. And all of these things can feed in together and influence this feeling and this experience of workplace culture. And don't worry, we're gonna talk a bit more about what belongs in that bubble of workplace culture. So first, why should we care about inclusion to begin with? I imagine that if you're on this call, you are already, you already care. But when we have to make this case, there are a few cases for inclusion and why we really should care and should promote it. Um, the first being the knowledge and innovation case. Diversity in science really actually helps to create better problem solving and better teams. Um, you know, diverse teams can be more creative and more flexible and just overall more innovative. There's also an economic case. Companies tend to perform better with more women in leadership 
And diversifying the labor pool can help meet job shortages, which I know is an issue in mining and something that has been highlighted, particularly in Canada. And then finally, we also have the fairness case. If we want to actually provide truly equal opportunities, um, dismantling barriers can help us do so. Now, I want to preempt a question that I often hear um, from, from engineers, from scientists, whenever talking about these topics. And it's the question of, shouldn't we just hire the best person? Can we just ignore gender? Maybe that's the best approach. And you know, there's something of a paradox when we think about the, this idea of meritocracy. People tend to believe that meritocracy is a great approach because it's all about rewarding merit and who's going to be the best. Unfortunately, there's some issues with this. Um, when barriers are present to people's participation, performance, then a lot of times we're not actually accurately being able to assess merit. Furthermore, this idea of who is the best or the best performance, this is often very subjective and it can be colored by the lenses that we see the world through. And then finally, we also have the issue that people who, are tr who try to be merit-based can end up being biased. One study found that when they encouraged people to either evaluate people's performance, to give them bonuses, um, when they were just focusing specifically without any instructions on just evaluating candidates, they gave people similar merit bonuses across the board. But when specifically instructing people to focus on meritocracy or to focus on rewarding merit, we found that this actually resulted in um, kind of a greater, uh, greater bonusing and benefiting of men. And we see a gender gap emerge when people focus on meritocracy. So just the idea of ignoring gender and trying to reward the quote unquote best people or hire the best people can actually wind up perpetuating these inequalities and reducing overall inclusion. So let's kind of talk a bit more about culture and kind of revisit this framework a little bit more. So when we think about underrepresentation, if we think about what the norms are in our culture, we have kind of the issue that we have to deal with those, deal with this reality we're in. If the reality is that 17% of people in mining are women, um, this actually creates a picture that colors the impression and colors how people will wind up seeing mining. So people's impressions of mining are very much going to be influenced by the current reality. And what I want to show is how this can create a potentially vicious cycle. So for instance, if most people working in mining or in engineering are men, this can lead people to then actually just tend to associate mining with engineering, mining and engineering much more with men than with women. Now we can see this actually, we've uh, done studies on this with both first year engineering students and professional engineers. And among students and professionals alike, we can see a te general tendency or what we call an implicit association where people tend to associate engineering more strongly with men than with women. Now to orient you to this figure on the screen, um, the y-axis is really kind of degree of association with higher the higher numbers and higher values on the axis and getting a stronger association of engineering with male and lower numbers that would be negative indicating an association of engineering with female. And the zero line here that we see is really the idea that there's no association. And if we look at both first year engineering students and professional engineers, both men and women tend to show this kind of, this tendency to associate engineering more strongly with males than with females. And unfortunately, this can really kind of color how we see the field and the assumptions that we make. Now I'm going to say that this is kind of despite the fact that students and well I'll show you more later that students and professionals are actually motivated to be unbiased. So even though we see slightly less bias, particularly among women students, um, we do overall observe this tendency, even among people who are pretty motivated to be unbiased. 
Now, this seeing the world and kind of having the reality of underrepresentation leading to reinforcing these, these uh, associations of mining with men more so than with women can wind up influencing how the institution functions and how people interact as well as kind of the beliefs and predominant um, kind of attitudes in an organization. Also, if we consider this association, it's pretty global. It's not just um, it's not just something that we see in specific environments. This is something that permeates all of society. This uh, figure in front of you here is actually in the STEM equals male associations in children, where we where children as young as six years old and up to eighteen were asked to draw scientists. And what we can see is, is that among the very youngest kids, um, kids are pretty likely to pretty um, likely to draw an equal number of male and female scientists. That dashed line down the center of the figure is about equal probability. They're closer to be likely to, to draw a scientist of their own gender. But we can see that over time, um, ki kids, boys and girls alike, are much more likely to draw scientists than men. Now, how does all of this kind of fit into the workplace? Because these things are associations that we carry with us, and they tend to only get stronger with time and with exposure. Um, it's, uh, this was actually written up in the Atlantic a while ago of this, uh, this finding of children drawing scientists. And overall, we actually do see some promising changes that, that kids are more likely to draw women as scientists, but they tend to um, uh, systematically see scientists more as male with age. All right, so in the workplace, if imagine that people in your organization hold this association of engineering with men, this could wind up influencing things like if whoever is purchasing your organizational safety equipment tends to see an engineer as looking like this guy here, they might be more likely to order, order coveralls that look like these coveralls here instead of ones like these, which we might expect to be more likely to be ordered if you're imagining that the prototypical engineer looks like this woman here. And the distinguishing feature between these is really the fact that there's a zipper at the waist. So this tendency to, to, have, to develop associations that reflect the world around us can lead to this implicit association of mining with men or engineering with men, which can in turn wind up influencing how organizational practices proceed in an organization. And all of this can create a vicious cycle um, of creating a workplace culture that is less inclusive. Now, this isn't just organizations or institutions. Companies, we actually see this at the nation level, that the more that, or, that um, nations have women in science majors, the lower the nation level implicit gender science stereotypes, whereas countries that have a higher, have a lower proportion of women in science majors tend to have stronger implicit gender science stereotypes. So this is something that is kind of permeates throughout the, um, throughout kind of the global culture, but it is very dependent on the actual local culture. So within a country, within an organization, the norms and practices can have a strong influence on even how implicit stereotypes are held and developed and expressed. And just to put, to locate that, this is Canada here on the map here. Okay, so thinking about workplace culture and how can we go about troubleshooting workplace culture for women to make it more inclusive. We can focus on building better institutional norms, policies, and practices that are aware of gender and pay mind to gender. We can focus on helping colleagues and also ourselves tackle our own implicit biases and beliefs. And we can also focus on interactions with colleagues and improving the nature of these interactions. Now, this last piece is something that is particularly of interest to our, uh, 
my colleagues and I and our, our team with Project Rise. So we think that this is pretty critical because all of these can together create vicious cycles. But we think that a lot of times we wind up experiencing the norms, policies, and practices of our institutions, as well as our colleagues' beliefs through these interpersonal interactions, and that these daily interactions are really what shape experiences of the workplace. So focusing in on these interactions, um, why do they matter? Because people tend to feel like they are doing well and like they are enjoying their careers and like they're engaged when they feel like they fit. And a lot of times this fit is reflected in our interactions with our colleagues and coworkers. They want to know that the field fits who, who we are. We want to know that it supports our goals. We also want to know that we're going to be respected. So when we look at some um, these types of daily interactions, we can see that the experience of social identity threat, which for women is this experience of feeling like gender is very salient and that you may be evaluated on your basis of gender, can have pretty profound consequences for women in the workplace. When we look at working engineers as well as STEM graduate students, we can see that consistently experiences of daily social identity threat predict higher levels of burnout for women. This is um, in this graph, you can see burnout on this y-axis, this vertical axis, and we can see low versus higher levels of daily social identity threat. For women who are low in daily social identity threat, they are, are no different than their male colleagues, really. If anything, it looks, they, they look slightly better um, in terms of daily burnout. But for women who are high in social identity threat, they're reporting more burnout than their male colleagues. And we see the same same pattern in a different sample of working engineers, as well as STEM graduate students. So overall, these kind of daily experiences from these interpersonal interactions can strongly influence how women feel in terms of their daily experiences of feeling emotionally drained, worn out, and needing time away from work. So when we think about gender inclusive culture, and we think about how we can actually foster environments that are more inclusive for women, we can try to target these daily interactions, but we need to do this within this overall framework of the organization and kind of situating this in interactions with colleagues. So if we could think about a framework for gender inclusive culture, culture is created through the organization level, which is gender inclusive norms, policies, and practices. Culture comes from our colleagues and their own beliefs and biases. And culture also comes from our interactions with our colleagues. And so in the context of gender, and this is something that we have focused on particularly in our kind of project rise in this upcoming workplace culture survey that we'll be sharing data from, we're looking at the experiences of acceptance, respect, and allyship from colleagues. So all of these together can create cultures that are more inclusive, which can in turn lead to feelings of better engagement um, and women, and actually um, people in your workplace in general. All right, so let's jump into the data that I'm here to share with you today. So this Rise Workplace Culture Survey uh, is a large survey of organizations across Canada and um, partially in the U one, one in the U.S. that we completed in 2018. Uh, this is the little the cover of our report. Now, this, we surveyed over 1,200 employees in STEM fields, um, primarily scientists and engineers and in, across a variety of sectors and um, a range of ages. The majority of our sample was uh, white and about a little under 70% of the sample was men. But we've had a fair number of women who were responding to this survey. So we asked all of these employees about their experiences in their workplace and the dynamics in their work environment. So the first thing that we would want to know is, are men and women different, like in terms of their, their experiences and their overall levels of engagement? Maybe, maybe there isn't a problem to begin with, because that's an important question. We need to consider that for some women there might not be a problem. So the first thing is, let's figure out if there's a problem to start with. 
So this is going to fo we're going to focus in on this side of our framework, just focusing on metrics of inclusion and engagement. So let's take a look at job commitment, efficacy, and fit by gender. So this figure, um, the y-axis, the vertical axis, is kind of the degree of each workplace outcome with higher values, indicating more of it. And along the x-axis, we're going to be looking at organizational commitment, self-efficacy at work, and just feeling the fit in the environment. The colored bars uh, indicate gender, with the teal bars being men and the orange bars being women. All right, so for organizational commitment, first we can look at this, and we see that Overall, men are reporting a slightly higher degree of organizational commitment than, than women. So men are saying things like they'd be very happy to spend the rest of their career with this organization, as one example. We also see something similar with self-efficacy, that men are reporting slightly higher feelings of self-efficacy, this idea that whatever comes their way, they can really handle it. And once again, with fit. Men are reporting just a greater feeling that they're connected with people in their field and that they really fit in their work environment. So we do seem to be seeing evidence of gender differences in these basic workplace outcomes. Now, is this even due to bias or is this about experiences related to bias or views? We can look at this as well. In this case, the y-axis is going to represent um, kind of these outcomes related to bias. We're going to look at social identity threat, the feeling that one's career has been impacted by bias and resistance to diversity across the X or horizontal axis. So starting with social identity threat, this is this idea that of being judged on the basis of your gender or concerns that your gender is going to affect how people evaluate you in your work environment. And what we see is that women report substantially higher levels of social identity threat than men in the workplace. We also see something similar for believing that one's career has been negatively impacted by bias. Um, women kind of report a higher level of believing that people's implicit gender biases have affected their performance at work. And then we see something a little bit different with resistance to diversity. Overall, this is actually quite low, but we do see that men report kind of greater beliefs that maybe Demands for gender equality are no longer necessary in modern society. Some of this is this idea that experiences of gender bias and sexism are in the past. All right. So we do seem to see evidence that there are basic differences in men and women's outcomes as in terms that are related to inclusion and engagement in the workplace. Let's focus in on what might actually predict these differences or the experiences that people have. So starting out with gender inclusive norms, policies, and practices, we can look at gender inclusive policies and practices in terms of what people report in the workplace. Um, having greater flex time, compressed work week policies, um, professional development, mentorship programs, etc. And what we can see is that we do see overall benefits of gender inclusive policies and practices. I'll orient you to two figures. On this left, we see social identity threat. Um, the vertical axis indicates uh, levels of social identity threat with higher values, indicating more concerns about being evaluated on the basis of gender. And the horizontal or y axis is the number of gender inclusive policies employees report being present in their organization. And what we can see is, is that for men, the gender inclusive policies and practices don't seem to make much of a difference in terms of social identity threat. Their levels are pretty low across the board. But for women, women in organizations that have a high number of gender inclusive policies and practices report levels of social identity threat that are very similar to the low levels that men report. However, women in organizations that have a low number of gender inclusive policies and practices tend to report much higher levels of social identity threat. And that can be represented here along with by this bar. So women with a low number of gender inclusive policies are reporting much higher levels of social identity threat and it's a strong relationship. Now here for organizational commitment, um, we can see that actually there are really no differences between men and women here. These, uh, these 
colored bands or confidence intervals. So there may be very slight dis distinctions, but for the most part, we see it's just an overlap and a positive relationship. And what this means here is, is that the more gender inclusive policies and practices in an organization, the more both men and women report greater organizational commitment. And this seems to indicate that there isn't really a cost to men of being in organizations that have more gender inclusive policies and practices. It's kind of a positive benefit for everyone. Okay, now let's take a look at implicit biases and beliefs and look at the relationship between that and inclusion. All right, so let's ask the question, do respondents on the survey show a STEM equals male implicit bias? So we can test this using a test called the implicit association test, where participants see on the screen in front of them words related to either engineering or um, family, and they're asked to kind of categorize them, or sorry, sorry words related to engineering, and, um, or family. and they're asked to kind of categorize them along with the names that are either typically male names or typically female names. So we can see here that they, like, in the center of, of this sample screen, the word design. Participants need to press I if the word belongs to either male or engineering, and E if not. Okay, so what we see is consistent with the prior data I showed you earlier. Male STEM associations are pretty pervasive. Among both people working primarily in engineering and in science, we see that men show a strong science equals male bias. And this bias is also present in women if in slightly lower levels. So both men and women alike seem to be showing evidence that they associate science and engineering more strongly with men and with women. So are there any kind of consequences to this type of prevalent association that we see among, like even women who you might expect to not hold these associations quite as strongly? We do actually find evidence that the implicit biases tend to predict women's social inclusion in organizations. So we did social network analysis where we asked people who they socialized with in their team informally. So for instance, who seeks got him to chat, to go for coffee, for drinks, or to connect outside of work. And we asked people to report for themselves and to report for all of their teammates, whether or not they socialized. And then what we see is that across the board, for both men and women, implicit bias is associated with socializing less with female teammates. So we see that among people with weaker implicit bias, we see higher levels of social ties and socializing with female teammates, whereas among people with stronger uh, negative implicit association, so associating um, women less with engineering or science, we see that they also socialize less with their women teammates. And these really just overlap for men and women. This is the same pattern for men and women alike. All right. So we do seem to see, have evidence in this work, survey of workplace culture that gender inclusive norms, policies, and practices, as well as colleagues' implicit biases, both influence inclusion. Now, now we want to kind of turn our attention to this idea of acceptance, respect, and allyship from colleagues, because we do have a strong sense of things that can negatively impact workplace culture. And we want to also think about what are positive things or things that can actually make workplace culture a lot stronger and better. So focusing in on acceptance and respect. Um, we introduced this concept of allies to participants. So we told them that allies are coworkers who are willing to support the interests of other individuals in their organization. And we're interested in the way that both men and women can support female engineers and scientists by serving as allies. And we, just, we gave them several behaviors that could potentially make someone an ally. Some examples of these would be encouraging women to pursue career-related opportunities, keeping women in the loop on information, and trusting women's reports of their experiences with bias. Now, 
We then asked both men and women to estimate the percentage of men and women in their workplace who are allies to women engineers and scientists. And what we can see is that both men and women agree that there's a high percentage of women who are, who are scientists. So my mouse is hot, sorry. <laughs> um, both men and women agree that there's a fairly high percentage of women are allies to other women in, in science and engineering. But there's a little bit less agreement among, on male allies, where men seem to be reporting that there's a higher percentage of men who are allies in their organization to women than women are. And this, but this could reflect one of two things. One is, is that men who are ally, who want to be allies and are engaging in allyship behavior are not necessarily um, adequately able to communicate that intention and it's not being picked up. Or it could be that men um, are engaged or have the desire to engage in allyship behavior, but what they're doing is not actually occurring at the or what they think they are doing is not occurring at the level that they feel it might be. So it could be that women are more accurate here, but we don't know. And this is one of the the limitations, but kind of realities of doing correlational research is we can't know who is accurate here, but we can do we can test that in other research. All right, so what types of allyship do participants describe men doing? We primarily saw reports of um, people reporting of men being allies by supporting, respecting, and accepting women and providing women work-related resources. And what we see is that particularly men as allies tend to, uh, to be associated with lower levels of social identity threat. So actually, both of these lines for men and women are slightly going down. So the more that people see men in the organization as being allies to women in, in science and engineering, the lower levels of social identity threat. We can see for men that's very slight. And then for women, we see a stronger relationship, such that women in organizations where they feel a very few number of their male colleagues are allies to women in science and engineering, um, kind of report much higher levels of social identity threat than do men, whereas women in organizations where they see most of their colleagues who are men as being allies to women in science and engineering are reporting very similar levels of social identity threat to men. Now we also see that both men and women report being motivated to be allies to women in STEM, so we don't tend to feel that there is any cost to male allyship. Among all, this line here for men is actually, if anything, um, men experience better outcomes as a function of there being more allies in the organization. And both men and women alike are pretty highly motivated to be allies. So allyship may be a very potentially powerful tool for promoting more inclusive culture. So we're going to focus on this idea of acceptance, respect, and allyship for male colleagues. And this is actually the kind of target of this upcoming research that we're going to be launching this June. And this is really a, this project designed to focus on interpersonal relationships in the workplace and how these can be used and leveraged to create more inclusive cultures and promote better engagement. So this project that I'm describing is Project RISE, which is a randomized controlled trial to foster inclusion, and it's going to be starting next month. And what we're doing is we're taking men and women who are working as STEM professionals and randomly assigning them to one or two conditions where they're going to, see, to complete a workshop kind of built around inclusive innovation, and this is our experimental or intervention condition, or a workshop on influential leadership, which is essentially our control condition for this randomized controlled trial. And we're going to be asking participants in this research to complete pre and post measures of allyship, network connections and inclusion, as well as other metrics related to engagement and to organizational commitment. And we're going to follow them for two years following this intervention. So we are and in the process of launching this research, and we're going to be recruiting participants very shortly, uh, recruiting new organizations to participate in this research if this is something that you might be interested in being involved in. And um, so this is really kind of building on the data that we've collected already with STEM professionals in science and engineering, and kind of building out from this to do a randomized controlled trial. Now, 
what is important about doing a randomized controlled trial and why is it particularly critical? If we look at the entirety of the literature on prejudice reduction, which is basically all the research on how do we reduce bias, there's very little in the way of, of true experiments, which are randomized studies. The majority of studies are actually non-experimental, which means that they're, they're often surveys or asking people about their experiences. About a third, a little under a third of studies are laboratory experiments, which is the kind of things researchers like myself and other members of our team do frequently where we bring people into the lab and have them interact in an environment like that. Only a small fraction are real world experiments where we go out into the field, out into organizational settings and um, do experiments in that setting. But even among that small percentage, we see less than 5% of real world experiments are with adults in the field. And so if we want to know how can we best target improving workplace culture and how can we best foster inclusion in the workplace by doing a randomized controlled trial in the field where we want to be able to make these differences, we're going to be have a, kind of a much better kind of mapping to the outcomes we want to change. So it'll be much better representative of these changes we want to be able to make in these real populations, which is professionals in engineering and science. Okay, so just kind of circling back, this once again is our team. Um, and this is a, this Project RISE, the survey data that I presented, this is all a collaborative effort between many people. But none of this would be possible without the participation of our partners. Um, who have been kind of invaluable and in both helping collect data as well as getting the word out and kind of helping to share our these findings. Okay, so if you're interested in learning more about this research or partnering with Project RISE, please don't hesitate to send us an email or get in touch with us on any of our social media platforms. And I now will kind of switch over and kind of open the floor for Q&A. Thanks so much, Tara. Your presentation was extremely interesting, and your research is, uh, I would say, pretty groundbreaking in the area that uh, you're focused, which is fantastic. Um, for anyone on the line that would like to ask questions, if you look at uh, your bottom right-hand corner of your go-to screen, um, there is an area there that you can um, type in questions, and we can, uh, I can pose them to Tara, and we can get them answered. Um, but uh, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, um, Tara, I was just wondering, um, you're clearly focusing in on the STEM side of things, which is fantastic um, and really a focus for our industry. Have you seen any research that you could compare the um, findings around STEM occupations with just um, industries in general that aren't um, as dominated by or or have as many women uh, working in the industry regardless of the occupation or would you say your your findings would be comparable to that specific for those stem occupations so some of the findings are, would be specific to fields where women are in the minority so and this is very this is kind of true more generally for people who are in the position of being negatively stereotyped being in the numeric minority, the, the, the fewer of people of your group in that field, the more that you're likely to experience negative outcomes related to underrepresentation. So we would expect to see this in fields like, so, say, philosophy, academic philosophy, politics, and fields where women are in lower numbers. Um, for men, we, there's actually research led by Dr. Tony Schmader and uh, other colleagues and collaborators focusing on men's experiences in healthcare, education, and um, kind of caring types of careers. So we do, we do kind of study the flip side of representation of what happens when men are in extremely low, low numbers, although there are some unique um, challenges that men face in those fields and a unique, unique set of stereotypes around who is communal and caring. So we, we tend to expect that there are going to be negative outcomes associated with being in the numeric minority, depending on the content of the field that you're in. So 
So if, the, if you are in a, a field where your group is stereotyped as being less competent, less capable, um, you are likely to kind of experience these same kinds of, of, low, of outcomes where you feel like you fit in less and you feel like you're more aware of your identity. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. No, that's great. Excellent. And um, we just have another question that's come in around um, what you talked about at the end uh, with the next step that you're at right now in your project and actually reaching out and engaging um, employers to get involved in your research. Um, just looking for a bit more information around uh, the timing of that, the, um, in, the amount of engagement by the employer and the commitment by the employer as well. Absolutely. So Project RISE is estimated to run about two years for the organization's, uh, organization's experience of it. So that's going to start with uh, an initial period of recruiting employees within the organization who are STEM professionals. And having them, having them, we do want them to volunteer. Although you, you can, you can stress the value of the of the research. Um, we are asking them to sign up. Then we are going to be doing a brief survey prior to doing this these workshops. So the workshops would take place um, in the, this kind of first year of participation in this research, and it's a pair of workshops. So every single organization would we would want them to be doing both workshops to be done together, delivered on on um, uh, back to back days. So there would be the leadership workshop and the inclusion workshop. Now these workshops take about four, between four and four and a half hours plus lunch. And um, half of the employees in the organization will be randomly assigned to one of the workshops and half would be randomly assigned to the other of the workshops. After the workshops, we are going to follow up for a period of about 24 months, where we will be doing brief surveys with employees, kind of a few weeks following the workshops, we're going to be doing kind of a period of 10 days of very brief micro surveys, where they just answer a few questions at the end of each day to get some of the daily experiences, like the data I showed earlier. And then we'll be following up at the end of about a year after the workshops, and, and then once again around two years after the workshops. So there is kind of this this total time period of where of about 24 months from start to finish for the organization. Excellent. And yeah. um, w would there be a cost uh, to um, participating in these workshops for the organization? So we do have have some basic operating costs. We uh, are working with professional facilitators to deliver these workshops. So there is a cost of about $12,000 for the pair of workshops. Now this is for up to up to 60, 60, 60 plus employees to participate in the entirety of the, the research and the workshops. And I can actually share with Jen, maybe we can make available some documents that have a bit more information about this. But you can also um, look on our website at successinstem.ca slash RISE, R-I-S-E. Um, there is some information for partners. Excellent, great. Yes, I can. Uh, we can share that uh, via email with attendees after. Um, if you'd like, that would be great. Um, Another question that has come in, um, are these simple metrics uh, organizations can use to measure, uh, to indicate inclusive culture and track to mentor, uh, sorry, to monitor to ensure they're moving in the right direction? You want that question again? Uh, so I, th I think I got it. I actually opened the question window. Um, okay, sure. So, I, so in some ways, yes, but I'm going to say that if you have a degree of remove between whomever's collecting the data and um, and your employees, the, that, that may be helpful. The reason for this is that one of the biggest concerns that we've found working in our, uh, doing this research so far is, is that participants are very concerned about privacy and their information coming back to their employers. So if you as an organization are trying to collect data, you really need to make sure that there's kind of really a built-in process for ensuring their confidentiality. You can collect simple metrics like, like we have collected. There are also kind of more standard 
diversity and inclusion metrics. Um, but things like to what extent do people feel like that they are included and respected by their colleagues are fairly simple metrics that can be tracked over time because these subjective psychological experiences are actually things that wind up being very powerful in terms of employees' um, feelings about their work. Excellent. That's uh, really interesting. If anyone else has any more questions, uh, please feel free to add them into the question box. Um, we do have a few more minutes before our scheduled wrap up of the webinar. Um, so we do have time to take another uh, question or two. Um, I really found it interesting, Tara, where you're talking about the impact of um, perceptions of engineers as kids get older and then come into adults. Um, do you have any insights into what type of interventions could happen at a younger age to help impact those uh, biases? So our consortium is is actually working on this. Um, so of the projects that we're doing, RISE is our project that it focuses on working adults. We do have projects targeting kids, both kind of younger ch children, um, kind of through our affiliation with Science World as well as kids and adolescents kind of in collaboration with Actua and kind of gearing up the Engineering Science Quest, other engineering science camps. Um, we, we are in the process of testing this. So right now there isn't very great, clear, strong evidence about what we can do. There's um, some evidence that promote that kind of creating accessible role models can encourage girls to go into to STEM, that emphasizing the value of um, like the value of engineering for achieving communal goals can actually help to help girls see um, see a future in fields like engineering that are often very much I'm gonna gonna fix this thing that's broken or I'm going to design something I'm going to to like to focus on this kind of more object related type of um, interest. But if you emphasize the communal value of fields like engineering or mining, meaning like how can you use this to help people? Or how can you use this to achieve a better societal good? Um, how can you focus on, like, how can you um, kind of incorporate sustainability? How can you help girls to achieve goals that are really around helping? Um, this can help. Um, girls see these fields as much more consistent with their own values. Excellent. And um, there was another question that came in actually kind of in the same line about uh, is there a sense of importance of STEM women visiting schools to be that visible representation of gender presence in the STEM area? So, um, you know, kind of in line with what you just touched, touched upon, but actually, you know, the impact of the of STEM women being in the schools, so there is that role model representation in the school system. Yeah, so I mean, role models and mentors can be very valuable for girls. I would, uh, but I wanna kind of also stress that um, some of what we just need to do is dismantle the stereotypes. There's some excellent research by um, a researcher named Sapna Sherian at the University of Washington, who's, she's shown that actually when we're looking at kids and people who aren't yet in the field, Sometimes having just someone who breaks the stereotype can be just as valuable as having someone of your same group membership. So that means that, so if a male engineer comes in and he's not what you might expect an engineer to be stereotypically, that could also be valuable for helping people who might not see themselves as fitting the stereotype want to pursue careers. Um, this, is like, this is not to diminish the importance of women as role models at all, but there is also a lot, there are a lot more demands on women's time when they're, when, when they're in the numeric minority. So I, something that we do encounter a lot is that some of the stress and burnout that women can experience in these fields is this feeling that they need to mentor and help everybody because they have, like, it's almost like this, this expectation. So we don't want to put women in the position of getting burnt out on promoting diversity either. So there are ways that we can actually involve men in this process as well. Excellent. We just have time for one more question. Um, and that is, are you seeing employment engagement surveys, including inclusion survey questions and the resulting engagement survey metrics being used 
to measure organizational leadership performance? That's, I think, a little outside of what we uh, what we've done as a consortium. Um, I think that there is some, some research that I didn't discuss, but uh, that I think is relevant here is, is that there is some research suggesting that if you make managers personally accountable for diversity, for improving diversity, this actually tends to move the needle more than things like standard diversity training. So if you do kind of treat leaders, if you do start to focus on inclusion as being a key organizational outcome, so not something that's kind of added on as lip service, but it's something that is truly like a key metric that leadership needs to achieve and you make leaders personally accountable, like there, like there, this evidence from kind of managers and diversity and hiring would suggest that there, there could be benefit for making um, inclusion be something that leaders need to, uh, like inclusion goals being something that leaders need to meet to um, meet their goals. Excellent, that's great. Well, we have uh, come to the end of our time um, and I think we've had a really good discussion. You're definitely very uh, exciting and uh, groundbreaking research that you're doing. Um, thank you to everyone for your questions and comments. Uh, thank you to uh, Tara for your presentation and sharing your insights and expertise. Um, we will be um, posting this recorded webinar as well as a blog in the coming days. So please look forward uh, for that information coming out. And uh, we will be sharing uh, the additional resources via email um, as we discussed as well. So this concludes our ensemble webcast. I look uh, out for the next one coming. Uh, up in the coming weeks. And uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.